Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of The Law of Self-Defense. Come on in. Come on in. Make yourselves comfortable. We have a bunch of law to do today. And yes, folks, it's a Thai show. It's almost always a Thai show. Um, that's when I'm working. When you see no Thai, that's when I'm having fun. But today is a working show. We're going to cover a whole bunch of little snippets of law from around the uh, country. In fact, just in the last hour before we went live at the moment, I had to add yet another state to this list. Surprisingly, the state of New York, where I used to live, where I went to law school. And uh, yeah, no one was more surprised than me. So we're going to go through uh, some law from uh, North Carolina, North Dakota, Kentucky, Oklahoma, New York, Missouri, Florida, Idaho. Some of this stuff is uh, laws that have taken effect uh, other stuff we'll cover is laws that are advancing through the legislature in their states, but all positive stuff for self-defense. And uh, so I thought it worth uh, kind of, it all happened within the last week, by the way, all popped up on my radar screen in the last week. Um, so it's um, a good opportunity to kind of cover all of these. None of these would be enough for a show by itself, but we have a, an aggregation that uh, makes sense to cover in uh, what will probably be kind of a lengthy show. We'll see what happens. For those who don't know, I am, of course, attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me make sure we're streaming everywhere we need to be streaming. We're good on... Hmm? There we go. We're good on uh, the member dashboard. We're good on... YouTube, we're good on, let's see, what about Rumble? Twitter is good, and uh, I don't know about Rumble. It looks like, yeah, good, we're good on Rumble. All right, so we're good everywhere we need to be. So as always, folks, as you come in, um, if you could, uh, please, if you're on uh, YouTube, watching on YouTube, or uh, Rumble, if you could hit that subscribe button, whatever the Rumble equivalent is of that. We're just about at, uh, how many subscribers are we at now? We're at uh, 48.3 thousand. It would be great to hit 50. So if you could hit that subscribe button, that would be appreciated. Tell your family and friends to watch the show and subscribe. Uh, the thumbs up like button, also very helpful. I think that's the single most important parameter YouTube uses. Rumble has its own version of that. Uh, and of course, if you could leave a comment, even if the comment is just your city and state, that also helps trick the hateful algorithm into sharing our law of self-defense content more broadly. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, oh, of course, the sponsor of today's show is none other. And this, you'll stop hearing about this soon, folks, because um, it's coming up. It's coming up real quick at this point. Um, the sponsor of today's content is none other than our very own. Oh my gosh, I have so many tabs open. Law of Self Defense Advanced Class coming up on Saturday, April 15th, about a week and a half from now. This is the only one scheduled for 2023, folks. This is the full day class taught live by me, streamed to you at your computer that teaches you how to be hard to convict if you're ever compelled to use force in defense of yourself, your family, your property. Uh, the class is filling up pretty well, but there's a few more days for folks to sign up. I, I think we still haven't gotten around to taking down the March um, discount. So if you click over, you may be able to grab the March discount before uh, IT gets around to uh, taking that out. It was not supposed to be applying this month, but nevertheless, you may have the opportunity to do that. You can learn more about this course at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. And that's also where you would sign up. And folks, even if you can't make it on Saturday, you have some scheduled conflict, I would still urge you to register for the class because we'll make the playback of the class available to you, to all the students, uh, whether they attended the live course or not, uh, for some time afterwards. So you'll be able to take a, the advantage of the opportunity at your leisure uh, after April 15th. And if you attended the live class on Saturday and you'd like to go over a portion of the class or the entire class again, you can do that with the playback version of the class. That's at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is um, some friends of ours have put together a documentary on guns and freedom. In fact, they call it Firearms and Freedom. And for, I think, a limited time, about another week, they're actually making this documentary available for free viewing. 
So that's the kind of stuff you like, gun stuff, freedom stuff. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at this documentary for the next week or so. It's completely free. Um, and you can learn more about that at lawofselfdefense.com slash movie. And was there anything else? I think, I think just maybe just the law cards. So law cards, these are uh, baseball cards that have been baseball type cards that have been put together by farmhand Tom, a fan of the law tube uh, community. And uh, they feature all your favorite law tubers, me included. There's Nick, me and Steve down in uh, Las Vegas a month or so ago, having a great old time. That was a long, long night. I lost a very good tie that evening. Uh, they have a whole series of cards just about me. Branca Burns, they call them. Folks, it's a gag gift, obviously, but if the kind of thing you'd get a laugh out of, I certainly got a laugh out of them. You may want to take a look at that and see if you'd, you'd like to acquire some law cards. And you can do that at lawofselfdefense.com slash law cards. All right, let's get to the law. Let's get to the actual law. So we have, we have law updates on, hmm, let's close that. Why is that open? From, uh, let's see how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, we're up to eight states. New, <clears throat> either uh, proposed legislation, bills going through the legislature, or actually passed into law um, in those eight states. Those are North Carolina, North Dakota, Kentucky, Oklahoma, New York, Missouri, Florida, Idaho. And uh, I thought they were collectively of sufficient interest that we could go over them today. So let's start. Let's see if I have the first one ready to go. We'll start with North Carolina. So what was the change that just happened in North Carolina? Well, North Carolina used to have this weird thing called a pistol purchase permit. So in addition to all the, uh, you know, the federal requirements, state requirements generally for the state um, that might be required for someone to purchase a firearm, if you wanted to purchase a pistol in North Carolina, you first had to go to your local sheriff. You had to go to your local sheriff and basically <clears throat> ask him for permission. My lord, my liege, may I please, please, from the kindness of your heart, have permission to purchase a pistol for lawful purposes. And the sheriff could approve or could deny the permit. Um, well, all of this scheme, this pistol purchase permit scheme, is nothing more, of course, uh, than a legacy of racism and slavery. Because when this pistol purchase permit framework was enacted, who do you think the sheriffs wanted to not have pistols? It wasn't the white people. They were happy for the white people to have pistols. It was the black people. It was newly freed slaves uh, that the, the, the authorities in North Carolina in that age wanted to be able to deny the lawful ability to buy pistols. So this legacy of racism has been in effect for, well, forever, uh, until the House and Senate in North Carolina passed a repeal of the requirement for the pistol purchase permit from the local sheriff, uh, much to the chagrin of the sheriffs, of course. They like their authority. They like to be able to tell you you can't buy a pistol when you would otherwise have no prohibition against buying a pistol. So of course the sheriffs never like to give up any authority. Um, the governor, Governor Roy Cooper, he decided to veto this repeal of the pistol purchase permit. And it's all as always with hair on fire rhetoric. Oh my gosh, if we don't have these pistol purchase permits, there will be blood in the streets. Just like they said when concealed carry was first passed in every state in the country. And it never happened. It never happened. They have to lie. They have to fear to try to get people on their side and constrain the ability of law-abiding American citizens to, to purchase pistols, firearms for lawful purposes. Uh, fortunately for North Carolina, uh, they had uh, sufficient majorities in favor of repeal of the pistol purchase permit scheme uh, that they were able to override the governor's veto. And so 
pistol purchase permits are no longer a thing in North Carolina. Congratulations, North Carolina. Good work. What a reprehensible thing to defend. And thank goodness that it's gone. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the next thing. This is in, let's see, North Dakota. North Dakota. And this one is dear to my heart. So the legislature in North Dakota is advancing something that I would call Kyle's Law. In fact, it has the support of Kyle Rittenhouse. And again, we have the hair on fire rhetoric from the mainstream media. Here's This is just an opinion column here by who cares who he is, uh, saying this is a bad idea. And what this provision essentially holds is that if you're charged with a use of force crime and you claim self-defense as a justification for your use of force and you're acquitted on the grounds of self-defense, the state ought to be obligated to pay your legal expenses. Makes sense to me because... The state knows when they decide to prosecute you for that use of force crime and they know you're raising the legal defense of self-defense, they know they have the burden. The state has the burden to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. If they can't do that, that's on them. And they ought to not use the process itself as a punishment. Now, my version of Kyle's law would go further. It would hold the prosecutor himself or herself personally responsible for some of those legal expenses, because they're the one that made the call. Why should it only be the taxpayer who has to reimburse this lawful defender? I think the prosecutors ought to have some skin in the game because right now there's zero disincentive for them to bring these politically motivated prosecutions like they did against Rittenhouse, like they did against uh, George Zimmerman. Uh, so we actually have the statutory language here. It's nice and concise. I love it when legislatures do this. So this is House Bill number 1213 working its way through the legislature of North Dakota and provides in relevant part that if an individual charged with a crime of violence is found not guilty due to the justification of self-defense, the court may order the state to reimburse the defendant for all reasonable costs incurred in defense, including loss of wages and time attorney's fees and other expenses involved in the defense. The reimbursement is not an independent cause of action. So the independent cause of action language means that the, uh, the acquitted defender would have to basically sue the state in court. So they're saying that they, they wouldn't have to do this. Uh, the one problem with this provision is the word may. The court may order the reimbursement. Folks, in my experience, that means it won't happen. They could have said shall or must, and then it would be non-discretionary. But remember, the court that has to make this call on may reimburse is also the court that declined to dismiss the criminal charges, which it could have done. As lacking probable cause because of the credibility of a self-defense justification for the use of force. So the same court decided, well, we're going to let the prosecution go forward. How inclined is it likely to be that same court is going to uh, use its discretion to reimburse the defender for their legal expenses and other expenses. Maybe, but I would much prefer if it had been made non-discretionary. Now, there is one state, Washington State, that uh, makes this the process for this more concrete. Uh, they actually require that the jury, um, if the defense requests it, uh, the jury be, be given a special jury form where the jury's asked, uh, do you, the jury, um, agree that it was by a preponderance of the evidence this was an act of self-defense because you don't need a majority belief it was self-defense in order to acquit on the grounds of self-defense. The jury only needs to have a reasonable doubt that it could have been self-defense. That's supposed to be enough for an acquittal. So a reasonable doubt that it could have been self-defense is a very low threshold of evidence. Preponderance, of course, is a hair over 50%. Um, so a, a reasonable doubt about self-defense would be enough to acquit but it wouldn't be enough to trigger this special jury finding. It needs to be a preponderance, and it needs to be a supermajority, not, uh, not unanimous by the jury. But if the jury signs that, um, says, yes, we, we believe it was by a preponderance of the evidence self-defense, um, then that defendant gets his legal expenses reimbursed. That's just the way it is. The jury decided. Here, it's, of course, discretionary. So that part's not that good, but it's movement in the right direction. Uh, and of course, 
we have we'll have these opinion pieces like we do here where it's all hair on fire this is bad policy blah 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 it's not it's not the threshold to drag an american citizen into a criminal trial where the stakes are the rest of his life in a cage is far far too low especially in the context of a credible claim of self-defense as justification we don't have a real probable cause standard in America anymore. Prosecutor can basically wave his hands and the grand jury will indict or, or wave his hands over a sworn information that judges will just accept. And off you go to the races. You're now a defendant in a murder trial. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. And even if you get acquitted on the legal merits, which you might not, no matter how innocent you are, guilty people get convicted all the time, folks. But even if you're acquitted on the legal merits, you spent maybe years waiting to be prosecuted for murder. And you know if you're convicted, you're going to jail basically forever. So what are you doing with your life while you're waiting for this murder trial? Are you starting a business? Are you going to college? Are you getting married? Are you having kids? No, your life is frozen. Your life is frozen. Plus all the cost, easily hundreds of thousands of dollars. Most of the cases I consult on, they go through $200,000 in legal expenses pre-trial in a killing case. And I'm generally consulting on serious felony cases. Um, and of course, again, there's always a greater than zero risk that you do get convicted. So I think the barrier to dragging people into um, serious felony criminal trials when there's a credible justification for self-defense is far, far too low. Just one lawyer's opinion. Okay, next state. The next state is... Kentucky. So this was brought to my attention uh, via Twitter. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know who Rob Romano is personally, this Twitter account, but uh, man, he does a great job with these uh, Second Amendment updates on Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, he, he would be someone I would recommend giving a follow to. Uh, but among his many other Second Amendment update posts, tweets, uh, he had this one. Kentucky governor allows bill prohibiting state and local police from helping enforce federal gun bans to become law without his signature. So this is now in effect. Um, I guess he didn't want to sign it. But it appears in Kentucky, if the legislature passes a law and the, and the governor just does nothing, it becomes effective generally after 10 days or so. It's pretty common, even if the governor doesn't sign it. Um, so let's take a look at what this statute actually does. Uh, House Bill 153, now law, uh, reads, see, no law enforcement agency, law enforcement officer, employee of a law enforcement agency, public agency, public official, employee of a public agency, blah, 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 blah. Uh, shall enforce, assist in the enforcement of, or otherwise cooperate in the enforcement of a federal ban on firearms, ammunition, or firearm accessories, and shall not participate in any federal enforcement action implementing a federal ban on firearms, ammunition, or accessories. No law enforcement agency, local government, public agency, shall adopt a rule, order, ordinance, or policy under which the entity enforces insists in the enforcement of or otherwise cooperates in a federal ban on firearms, ammunition, or firearms accessories. No local government employee of local government, public official, public agency, or employee of a public agency shall expend public funds or allocate resources for the enforcement of a federal ban on firearms, ammunition, or firearms accessories. Pretty straightforward. You cannot use state law enforcement or governmental agencies or resources to enforce federal bans on guns, ammunition, or accessories. Now, if there is a federal ban, can the feds come and arrest you? and prosecute you for violating their federal law. Sure, they'd have to target pretty selectively because they don't have the resources to enforce this kind of stuff broadly. Of course, if you're the person targeted, well, then you're looking at a federal felony, typically five or 10 years in prison per count. So as we can see with the January 6th protesters, when the feds want to make an example of you or a group of you um, under this attorney general, Merrick, Garland, imagine if he'd been put on the Supreme Court. Imagine, imagine if, here's a thought experiment. So Trump was elected 
And a lot of people were kind of wishy-washy about Trump's character. Fair enough. But the only alternative to Trump, the only credible alternative, was Hillary Clinton. Now, there was this McMullen character running, third party. Of course, he got, how many, how many electoral votes did McMullen get? How many electoral votes does any third party candidate get in American politics? Zero. So McMullen, not a factor, unless he had diverted votes from Trump, of course, in which case Hillary would have won. But Trump got elected. He appointed three Supreme Court justices. The Bruin decision, which is by far the most powerful pro-Second Amendment Supreme Court decision we've seen yet. Hopefully we'll see more. But Bruin is driving the gun control people crazy for good reason. Uh, the three justices appointed by Trump all voted for it. They were in the majority, and that was a 6-3 vote. Imagine if Hillary had been the president appointing three Supreme Court justices. What do you think the vote on Bruin would have been? It would have been 6-3. It would have been 6-3 the other way. And that's not hard to predict because one of the candidates, one of the nominees for Supreme Court by the Democrats, and Hillary said she would appoint them, is Merrick Garland. Currently, the Attorney General prosecuting, persecuting the January 6th protesters, many of whom did nothing but walk through an apparently open and inviting door and walk around the Capitol. That's the guy who would have been voting on Bruin. So, say what you will about Trump. And for those of you who care about abortion, same story, 6-3 vote, repealing Roe v. Wade, overruling Roe v. Wade, would have been the other way, right? If Hillary had been elected. Something to keep in mind. So, good for Kentucky. Now, um, mostly, of course, this is sending a message to gun owners in Kentucky that their state government has their back. That's a good message. I like it. And hopefully they'll do more of this. All right, next state. Was that too much of a rant? Next state is Oklahoma. This one is near and dear to my heart. So Oklahoma is um, addressing the issue of curtilage in the use of force law context. So you've heard me talk about this many times. In When we're talking about defense of highly defensible property, that always includes your home. Um, it always includes inside the four walls of your home. That's highly defensible property. You get special legal privileges for use of force that wouldn't exist if you were out in the public street. Uh, often there are legal presumptions of a reasonable fear of deadly force harm when there's an intruder breaking into your home. Uh, there may be a legal presumption that someone breaking into your home is doing it for the purpose of committing unlawful violence on the people within the home. Uh, you have the castle doctrine, of course, so if you otherwise would have had a legal duty to retreat, uh, you're relieved of that legal duty within your castle, within the four walls of your house. But these provisions, these special provisions for the defense of highly defensible property, they um, typically don't end at the four walls of your house. Typically, they extend to the area immediately around your home that's part of the normal day-to-day -day use of your home. There's a legal term for this area around your home that's part of the normal day-to-day -day use of your home, and that is curtilage. So typically, these special provisions, like the Castle Doctrine, for example, uh, a reasonable fear of harm, a, re a, a legal presumption that the other party is there to commit acts of unlawful violence, would apply within the home and the curtilage of the home. Here's the problem. Uh, curtilage is generally not defined very well anywhere. Uh, occasionally you'd see a state that would say that this includes the front porch, back porch of the house. But, but the real boundary of curtilage was always subjectively determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So maybe the judge in your trial would, would make that call as a matter of law, or maybe the jury would be given that general description, the area around the home that's part of the normal day-to-day -day use of the home, and they would make a subjective judgment call. The point is, you never know if you're outside the four walls of your house, whether you're in your curtilage or not. In the moment, you don't know because it's a decision that will be made by somebody else at a later date. 
Well, what Oklahoma is doing here is providing a concrete definition of curtilage for self-defense law purposes, and they're defining it all the way out to the property line. So typically how curtilage works is uh, say you have a house on, I don't know, a couple of acres of property. And eventually you reach the ends of the property and it's become someone else's property or it becomes a public way. Uh, once it's someone else's property or, or you no longer have a right of exclusion, it's, it's a public way. Well, your curtilage is definitely ended, but it's always been ambiguous before you reach that point. You might, you might've lost curtilage benefits. Um, again, it's decided on a subjective case by case basis, typically. So you never really know whether you're in your curtilage or not. Uh, what Oklahoma is doing is saying, you know what, we're, we're going to take away that ambiguity. We're going to say your curtilage extends all the way to the property line. No matter what size the property is. Now, typically, if you had a home on like 40 acres, that 40th acre would not normally be considered curtilage. But it would be under this Oklahoma bill. And that's working its way through. Um, and the way, of course, the media reports all this in a hair on fire manner again. So the title here of this uh, news report, uh, and by the way, if you're a law self-defense member, I'll, uh, when we put this up as a blog post, I'll put links into all these news reports and documents so, um, and bills, statutory and language, uh, so you can uh, access it yourself if you like. Uh, but here's a, a news report from a Oklahoma news station. Oklahoma House Republicans vote to expand self-defense law on private property. Republicans voted to pass an expansion of the state's Castle Doctrine, which says people are entitled to use deadly force to protect their homes. That's not what Castle Doctrine means, of course. Castle Doctrine only means, properly understood, it only means that if you would have had a legal duty to retreat before you can use force and self-defense, you're relieved of that legal duty within the context of your highly defensible property, your castle. Um, there may be other legal provisions for defense of highly defensible property, like we just talked about, uh, but those are not properly, they, they're frequently, but they're not properly referred to as castle doctrine. Of course, Democrats, Democrats, Democrats are worried the expansion will lead to deadly misunderstandings, unnecessary killings. They were quick to point out that throughout Oklahoma, large properties often have very few markings and people could be unknowingly trespassing. Uh, okay, well, I guess that's theoretically possible, but does that put them at risk of being lawfully shot? Can you lawfully shoot a simple trespasser who's not threatening? No, no, you cannot, folks. Uh, so shooting a simple trespasser was unlawful before. It'll be unlawful after this passes. Hopefully it will pass. House Bill 2049. The bill's author, Rep. David Harden argued such an instance, though, wouldn't warrant deadly force. Well, of course not. It's a simple bill, he says. On your property, if you feel that your life is threatened, you have the right to protect yourself. That's nice. I like that. He argued his bill wouldn't be viewed as controversial, saying Oklahomans should be able to protect themselves from a threat even if they're outside their home. House Bill 2049 adds language to current state law that expands the ability to use deadly force to protect themselves not just in a dwelling, but also on private property. Uh, the author of the bill says, this bill is never intended for you to walk out and shoot anybody on your property. This bill is intended to protect yourself when you go to your property, wherever it's at, and ask somebody to please leave. Of course, Democrats have a very different take. They say, what we've basically done with this bill is you have enlarged the killing fields. Have we? I don't think so. Uh, the Democrat says they're concerned about hundreds of people trying to do business and finding themselves in a life-threatening situation. Uh, what if there are language barriers, Mr. Speaker? What about cases of mental health breakdowns? There are too many opportunities for accidental mishaps if we extend the Castle Doctrine. Are there? Why would this be a language barrier issue? If someone's, you're on property you know you don't own, you know you don't own it, and someone's yelling at you, don't you just leave? Why wouldn't you just leave? So, no, there won't be any misunderstandings. This is just the Democrats doing, again, their hair on fire act. Uh, House Bill 2049 passed along party lines, uh, meaning, of course, the Republicans all voted for it, and typically enough, the Democrats all voted against it, and now heads to the state Senate. So hopefully we will see that continue to advance. Uh, if nothing else, for purposes of clarity of the law. Ambiguous laws are bad. 
because we can't tell if what we're doing is legally privileged or not. The property line is a very nice black and white way to understand where your curtilage ends. They could do it differently, I guess. They could say out to 100 yards from the home or 500 yards or whatever, and then what? Then you have to put stakes in the ground? Property line is nice and clean. And uh, and if people don't want to be uh, befuddled by this, they could stay off of pe other people's property. Okay, next up. Oh, well, I have the actual uh, legislation here. So, um, oh, by the way, another nice thing. So uh, highly defensible property, of course, always includes your home. Uh, it often, often also includes a uh, place of business. Sometimes it has to be your place of business. Some, sometimes it could be any business. You, you're a customer there, and it would still qualify for you as highly defensible property. Typically includes an occupied vehicle. Um, not commonly on the list has been places of worship. Uh, but Oklahoma includes places of worship as highly defensible property, gets all the same uh, legal presumptions, uh, favorable to self-defense as you would have if you were in your home. And, and I just note this here. So um, uh, a person, regardless of official capacity or lack of official capacity within a place of worship or a person, an owner, manager, employee of a business is presumed to have held a reasonable fear of imminent peril of death or great bodily harm to himself when using defensive force that is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm if the force was used against someone unlawfully and forcefully, forcibly entering. This is the kind of legal presumption law, law I was just referring to. Uh, and it has all the usual, these are very common common language in states that have these. Uh, obviously the effort of, uh, I, I'm not sure who it was, but some, they, they have these legislative drafting entities. Sometimes the NRA may do this, for example, um, where they'll say, hey, we think this would be a great law to have. So we're gonna draft model language and try to find legislatures in various states to introduce it and get it passed. And when that's done, you tend to see the same statutory language in a whole bunch of different states because they all started from the same uh, memo. Uh, but let's get to the point uh, uh, I wanted to discuss here, the curtilage. Dwelling, and uh, you can tell this is new statutory language, folks, because the, the underlined words are new uh, and the words that are being taken out are the old language that's being stricken. Uh, so I'm just going to read the underlined part. Dwelling means the parcel of land to the property lines and any building or structure erected thereon of whatever form, regardless of whether movable or temporary, so RVs, uh, which is for the time being the residence or place of lodging of the person. Pretty cool. To the property line is the critical part here. All right. So that would be... Oklahoma. Next up, we have New York. New York, of all things. Uh, and this comes from, uh, I, I should make very clear that this is a, should be understood to be very narrow, this New York change in law I'm sharing with you. This was a, a decision on a motion by a trial court judge in New York State. In Orange County, uh, which is not, it's not New York City, but it's immediately adjacent. It's just north of New York City. Uh, a little more country, but it's not like upstate New York, which lot, large parts of New York are pretty conservative. But of course, all the population is around Metro New York City. Uh, this was a trial judge. Hey, they, uh, um, there was a, uh, a red flag law was put into effect against someone. It was claimed that he waved a gun at somebody. So, of course, New York B State being what it is, they have a red flag laws. And uh, that means effectively that that person's civil rights, their gun rights, can be stripped of them uh, without a hearing. Uh, without the opportunity for them to tell their side of the story. And the cops just come and take all your guns because someone made an allegation. Somebody didn't like you. Uh, and this trial judge uh, received the motion from the person who'd been red flagged. And the person was asking the judge to do away, to strike the, uh, the red flag, his prohibition on being able to keep his guns. Uh, and in fact, to declare... New York's red flag law, unconstitutional. Now, can a trial judge do that? Yeah, sure, of course. With respect to the particular parties before that trial judge. Now, is that trial judge's ruling binding on anybody else? Does it have pres precedential authority over any other court, any other parties? No, it's binding on the court for those parties. It's not even binding on other parties. So like if this same judge had a different red flag case come before him, 
I, he, I guess he could rule differently. Um, that would be, you know, logically inconsistent, but it would be up to him. So that's what I mean when I say this particular law I'm sharing is of very limited scope. In theory, it applies only to these parties. And by the way, I would expect the state to appeal this uh, to the appellate division in New York. Uh, and from there, it would, in theory, go to the Court of Appeals. New York State is weird. Their highest level state court is not called the Supreme Court. It's called the Court of Appeals. Don't ask me why. Uh, so you have trial courts, appellate division, and then the New York State Court of Appeals is their highest court. If it went up those levels, I'm, I'm sure uh, it would, this motion would be reversed. So we'll have to see what happens. But it's nice. It's nice to see that even in a, um, a place immediately adjacent, a county immediately adjacent to New York City, uh, you, you can stumble across a trial judge who's going to find red flag laws unconstitutional, as they should be. They are. They are, folks. And they're pointless because if a person is genuinely dangerous, taking away their guns doesn't solve that problem. What's to keep them from hopping in their car and just running over a parade? We've seen that happen. If the person is genuinely dangerous, the answer is to prove it in court and then have them institutionalized until such a time as they're safe. And those rules already exist everywhere. So, of course, this whole red flag law thing is, is, is just these gun control laws that are intended to have a chilling effect on people's exercise of their Second Amendment civil rights. That's why they're contemptible, and that's why they're an infringement of our Second Amendment rights and should be held facially unconstitutional everywhere. Uh, but let's take a closer look at this ruling. It's quite short, and I'll, I'll skip over the, uh, the legalese parts to the best I can. Uh, the respondent, CM, CM would be the person who got red flagged, moves for an order declaring New York State's red flag law unconstitutional and unenforceable. Uh, so the instant matter arises out of the issuance of a temporary extreme risk protection order against CM on January 20th, 2023. So a couple months ago, uh, a petition was made by uh, somebody said this guy brandished a loaded shotgun, cocked it and pointed it at his neighbor during a verbal dispute. Not that many, not that many shotguns you, you cock these days, but whatever. Uh, the respondent denies these allegations and challenges the constitutionality of New York's red flag law. Uh, then they go through the statute. We all know what red flag laws are. Uh, let's see. Uh, and here's, uh, here's where the judge, this trial judge digs in. Uh, without the requirement, because New York's red flag law doesn't require any medical testimony or psychiatric evaluation, uh, without the requirement of any input from a medical or mental health expert, the court is required to make a determination of whether the respondent is likely to engage in conduct that would result in serious harm to himself, herself, or others. You think trial judges are qualified to make that assessment? Or you think they would just, especially in a state like New York, just default to the position that, well, I'm, I'm just going to play it safe and always take this guy's guns away because if the worst happens, I could be held accountable. Uh, under, under mental hygiene law, section 9.39, and this would be the already, the non-red flag, the already existing law for institutionalizing someone who's a danger, okay? Under mental hygiene law, a person's liberty rights cannot be curtailed unless a physician opines that the person is suffering from a condition likely to result in serious harm. Further, in order to extend any such curtailment of liberty beyond 48 hours, a second doctor's opinion must be obtained, and such opinion must be consistent with the first doctor's opinion. Absent from New York's red flag law is any provision whatsoever requiring even a single medical or mental health expert opinion providing a basis for the order to be issued. New York's red flag law, as currently written, lacks sufficient statutory guardrails to protect the citizen's Second Amendment constitutional right to bear arms. Um, then it starts quoting here, Second Amendment rights are no less fundamental than Fourth Amendment rights, the right to liberty, and must be provided the same level of due process and equal protection. Uh, this is a cite from McDonald, right? Heller and McDonald, two, of course, famous pro-Second Amendment Supreme Court cases. Accordingly, this court joins the Monroe County Supreme Court in holding that under uh, this legislation, in order to pass constitutional muster, the legislature must provide that a citizen be afforded procedural guarantees. That's due process of law, folks. 
such as a physician's determination that a respondent presents a condition likely to result in serious harm before a petitioner files for a red flag. Since the standard is required, since this standard is required to prevent a respondent from being deprived of fundamental rights under the mental hygiene law, then anything less deprives a citizen of a fundamental right without due process of law. This court declares New York State's red flag law to be unconstitutional. Bam. So good stuff from New York State. I don't expect this to last very long, uh, but kudos. Kudos to Judge Craig Stephen Brown. Thank you, sir. Thank you for putting your signature on this piece of paper. Much appreciated. And that happened just today, I think. He signed it today. That's how quick we got a hold of this. All right. Next up, we have Missouri. Uh, this is not a complicated one. This is uh, House Bill 282 working through the legislature. Uh, currently, I guess Missouri has a prohibition on carrying firearms, even if you're licensed for concealed carry, on public transit and public uh, vehicles. Uh, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, so of course, uh, this is another way that the the gun control fascists attempt to put a chilling effect on people exercising their constitutional rights. And as usual, it mostly affects poor people. And what demographic in America is disproportionately poor? Black people. So these gun control laws disproportionately impact, infringe the civil rights of black people. That doesn't sound like a good idea to me. It sounds kind of racist. But just like with the North Carolina pistol purchase permit framework, all these gun control laws originally existed in order to deny black people the civil rights that white people were entitled to, particularly, of course, their Second Amendment rights. It's utterly contemptible. Um, I'm, you're not likely to find me on public transportation very often, folks, because I drive a car around. But when I was a kid, when I was a student, did I take public transport? Sure, all the time. Boston, Red Line, that was me going into Harvard Square every day. And when they tell you you can't carry a gun on public transportation, they're telling you you can't effectively be armed for self-protection or the protection of others because your circumstances require you to make use of public transportation. Nothing, nothing but a chilling effect law. Uh, so the House Emerging Issues Committee, this is still going through committee, voted 10 to 4 to approve this House Bill 282 to ensure that law-abiding citizens may carry firearms for self-defense on public transportation. You think that the Democrats are going to be doing their hair on fire act here too? Does anybody think the bad guys are not carrying their guns on public transportation? I'm pretty sure they are because bad guys don't follow the law. All, the, all laws like this do is disarm the law abiding. I, folks, that's why I'm a second amendment absolutist. Uh, all these laws do nothing but infringe the rights of law-abiding people. They do nothing to prevent criminals from being bad actors and having all the guns they want and carrying them anywhere they want to. All we do with laws like this is enrich the population of defenseless innocents that those bad actors, those criminal actors, can predate upon. Uh, and this is just the, uh, the language itself here. See if I, I can't remember if I highlighted it, but we can look at the actual language. Hopefully I did. There's a lot of stuff in here. If I didn't highlight it, I'm not going to look for, oh, here we go. All right. Uh, notwithstanding any other provision, to the contrary, a person carrying a firearm concealed on, on or about his or her person who is lawfully in possession of a valid concealed carry permit or endorsement shall not be prohibited or impeded from accessing or using any publicly funded transportation system and shall not be harassed or detained for carrying a concealed firearm on the property, vehicles, or conveyances owned, contracted, or leased by such systems that are accessible to the public. Good. No rational reason for this kind of restriction, given that we know the bad guys are not going to themselves be constrained. All right. Next, we have Florida. Florida. This just became law. The governor down there just signed it. Uh, but of course, this is Florida's adoption of permitless 
concealed carry. Uh, so, of course, Florida was one of the first states to allow for concealed carry in the modern era. Uh, now, at the time, I don't remember when it was. I would have to Google it. Um, but at the time, most states, most states did not have a provision for lawful concealed carry of firearms by civilians. Ironically enough, I was living in Massachusetts at the time, and Massachusetts did have a system for lawful concealed carry. I know, you'll be shocked. Now, it's a, it was a rather archaic system. The, the permits were not issued by the state. They were actually issued by your local police chief in your town. Kind of sounds like the, the sheriff pistol purchase permit system in North Carolina, right? You think the Massachusetts system might have had its foundations in your local police chief getting to personally decide who he liked and who he didn't like, who he thought should have a gun and who not? on a whim, because those licenses in Massachusetts were uh, completely at the whim of your local police chief. Uh, and as you might imagine, the closer you got to Boston, the harder they made it for you have the permit and the more conditions they put on the permit. So if you lived out, you know, Metro West, the 495 Beltway, which is, I don't know, 20 miles outside of Boston, uh, if you lived there or beyond, you generally didn't have a problem uh, getting a concealed carry permit. Carry a gun on your person as you go about your business. I never had any problem. I, I had a concealed carry permit the entire time. I lived in Massachusetts all, all 25 years because I made I was careful to live in towns where I knew the police chief was amenable to issue. But if you live closer to Boston or in Boston, uh, they either won't issue you a permit or they issue a permit to own a gun because you need a permit even to own a gun, a handgun, any gun in Massachusetts, um, but not to carry. So it was invalid for concealed carry, but you, you could have it in your house. You could carry it unloaded to the range and shoot it there, that kind of thing. Uh, so a very archaic system. You had to be very careful, very careful about where you chose to live. But Florida, uh, in the modern era, Florida was one of the first to adopt a modern concealed carry permit process that was really great. Uh, it, and not just for residents, but for non-residents. So I've had a non-resident Florida permit since they started. I mean, they made the announcement. I sent in my check and my application. And you could do it entirely over the mail. It was fantastic. You didn't have to make a personal appearance. Um, and I had family in Florida, so I went there quite frequently. So the, the non-resident permit was very, very helpful. Um, although the one time I, I did have to show it to a uh, Florida law enforcement officer because I... I there was a fracas and I, he arrived because I called him to the scene and I wanted him to be aware that I was armed. I didn't want to surprise him. Uh, so I showed him uh, my, my non-resident concealed carry permit and he'd never seen one before. <laughs> he didn't know what it was. Uh, but nevertheless, I had it on my person. The trouble with all these permitting is just like the trouble with these laws that say you can't carry on public transport. The bad guys don't get permits. They don't have concealed carry permits. They probably couldn't qualify, of course, because most criminals have a criminal history, um, but they don't bother with such things. All these permits do is infringe the rights of law-abiding people to have firearms for lawful purposes. That's it. And they get expensive. So I'll make up numbers. I don't remember. I think my Florida non-resident permit was like $135, something like that. But of course, you have to take a you know a NRA pistol course. First, that, that'll be a requirement. You have to get fingerprints done and police stations charge you for that. Um, and it may not sound like a lot of money to, to many of you, but it, it can be two or 300 bucks, easy. And a lot of people don't have an extra 300 bucks laying around for a gun that they may never need, right? We don't know. So who does this impact? When you, when you increase these costs for a person to have a gun for lawful purposes like defense of themselves and their family, the people impacted are poor people, which is disproportionately going to be black people. So again, it's racist. Requiring any of this is racist. All this permitting is ridiculous, facially unconstitutional, and pointless because, again, black, uh, bad guys, bad guys uh, don't follow the law. Law-abiding people of every race, both genders, either gender, any creed, Ought, ought to be able to exercise their natural right and constitutional right to keep and bear arms on their person for personal protection effectively everywhere. 
without any conditions other than them being law-abiding and for lawful purposes. So what Florida has done is they've effectively made their permit system unnecessary. Uh, th this law that passed the House and Senate in Florida, I'm sure, along party line votes, again, Republicans voting for an expansion of civil rights and the Democrats voting for a constraint of civil rights. By the way, when the Civil Rights Acts were passed in, in the 60s, guess who voted for them? Republicans. Guess who voted against the Civil Rights Acts? Democrats. This never changes, folks. It never changes. When, when there's to be an expansion of civil rights, enumerated rights in the Constitution, the Republicans vote for it, the Democrats vote against it. So this was passed, and uh, uh, Governor DeSantis down in Florida signed it, I think, yesterday. Uh, so it's now effectively law. And all it really does is say, hey, you, you're, you're privileged to carry a gun. It's lawful to carry a gun on your person concealed if you have a permit or... If you don't have a permit, but you otherwise would have qualified for a permit. So if you had jumped through the hoops and gotten a permit, and, and if you had done all that, you would have been granted a permit, then, then we're going to treat you as if you already have the permit. That sounds pretty reasonable to me. So the person who doesn't have an extra 300 bucks laying around can exercise their legal privilege to carry a gun on their person concealed for personal protection for lawful purposes. Um, and not be denied that privilege simply because they don't have an extra 300 bucks laying around. So let's take a look here at the actual statutory language. It's just like I told you, but it's always, and this was uh, House Bill 543, uh, but it's law now. So the, um, in effect, uh, I don't know if it takes effect immediately. States vary on that, but the, the statutory language will reflect the changes put in here. And I know I highlighted this, uh, let's see. And they have some other stuff in there about schools setting up um, armed security. That's all good. That's good stuff too, but not the topic of what we're talking about here. There it is. So section 79001, carrying concealed weapons or concealed firearms. And this is an existing statute. But what's happening here, again, is the underlined language you see here in the bill is the new language that's being put into the statute. And the, the language that's crossed out is the language that's already in the statute, but it's being stricken. So it doesn't have effect moving forward. Uh, so it reads, a person is authorized to carry a concealed weapon or concealed firearm if he is licensed under 79006. So you get a concealed carry license like you previously could do, or is not licensed under 790.06, but otherwise satisfies the criteria for receiving and maintaining a license under the permit system. Nice. So if you would have qualified, had you jumped through the hoops, you're good to go. Now, if you wouldn't have qualified because you wouldn't have been eligible for whatever reason, you have a criminal history, then you don't get the benefit. Carrying a gun, a gun con concealed, uh, not able to qualify for a permit is going to be treated like it used to be treated if you just didn't have a permit. But just because you didn't pay the money and jump through the hoops, we're not going to deny you the privilege to carry concealed if you would have qualified had you paid the money and jumped through the hoops. So great, great stuff. Let's see what else is here. Uh, in any prosecution for a violation of this law, uh, it's the state that bears the burden of proving as an element of the offense, whatever the gun charge would be, um, both that a person is not licensed Easy enough to do, right? Just check the state records. And that he is ineligible to receive and maintain a license. And the state would have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, most of the other stuff here is, uh, is uh, administrative. There was something else I wanted to touch. Oh, this was nice too. Uh, a non-resident of Florida. So as I mentioned, Florida allows for non-resident permits. I've had one forever. My current home state of Colorado, there's no such thing as a non-resident permit. So either you have a, you live in Colorado as a resident, you get a Colorado concealed carry permit, or you're from a state where Colorado has reciprocity. Um, when I used to live in Massachusetts and visit Colorado, that didn't work because Massachusetts will not recognize anybody else's permits. So because Massachusetts doesn't offer reciprocity, no other state offers reciprocity. So although I had a Massachusetts concealed carry permit, Colorado wouldn't recognize it because of the lack of reciprocity. 
And I didn't have an option for a non-resident concealed carry permit in Colorado because it just doesn't exist. That's not a thing here. Florida has non-resident permits. But what if you're moving to Florida? Uh, and once you're a resident, you're going to want to apply for a Florida resident concealed carry permit. Um, so you don't want to apply for a non-resident ahead of time. Basically, you're paying an extra 150 bucks for nothing. Uh, what Florida says here in this new statutory language is that if you're coming to Florida with an existing concealed carry permit from your home state, whatever home state that might be, we're going to treat you as if that were a valid Florida concealed carry permit for, I forget, 60 days or some reasonable period of time in order for uh, you to jump through the hoops in Florida to get there recognized. Oh, 90 days. Um, I think that's a pretty good provision too. Uh, so you're not, like when I moved here from Massachusetts, the moment I left Massachusetts was no longer a resident. My, my concealed carry permit there was invalid in the eyes of Massachusetts. Um, and when I got to Colorado, I had to jump through the hoops and take a safety course and apply through the local sheriff here. And it took a month or whatever. But for that month, I didn't have a concealed carry permit that was valid in Colorado. Uh, Florida solves our problem here with this provision. All right. And the last, the last state, oh, pretty good timing, really, is Idaho. So, um, Okay, yeah, this is a, a defensive display statute. This is just a little news notification here. SB 1173, I guess it's gone to the governor for his signature. Um, that was that was uh, a few days ago. Let me see if this has been updated. I'd like to think so. Um, Idaho, right? Sounds like the kind of place that would uh, the governor would be inclined. Um, yeah, I don't see any any updates yet, and I'm not going to take everyone's time to look into it. Let's presume it'll be signed, uh, but it's a defensive display statute. So let's look at the statutory language real quick. Uh, it reads, and it's underlined, right? So that tells us this is new statutory language that would be incorporated into an existing statute, right? The existing statute is just a self-defense statute, 19-202, resistance by a threatened party. And the new paragraph two here and paragraph three is the defensive display or declaration of a firearm by a person is justified when and to the extent a reasonable person would believe that physical force is necessary to protect the person against the use or attempted use of unlawful force, including deadly force. Um, this provision does not apply to someone who intentionally provokes another person to use or attempt to use unlawful force. Um, for purposes of this section, defensive display shall include verbally informing another person that you have a gun, um, exposing, displaying, or placing a person's hand on a firearm while the firearm is in a holster or other means of containment um, so that a reasonable person would understand was meant to protect the person or another against an unlawful use of force. The provisions of the section do not require a defensive display or declaration of a firearm before you can otherwise act in lawful self-defense. So defensive display is always a sketchy area of the law because we are all good people. We're all law abiding. And we know that we would never display a gun at someone unless we believed we were doing it for lawful purpose, for defense of ourselves or defense of other people to stop the person um, we're pointing the gun at from doing some terribly unlawful, threatening, violent thing. But of course, bad guys point guns at people all the time, unlawfully for no lawful purpose. Uh, and prosecutors get these cases across their desk. And remember, the prosecutor who's deciding whether or not to charge you with a crime and pointing a gun at someone unlawfully would be aggravated assault with a firearm, typically good for 10 to 20 years in prison if they want to throw the book at you between the underlying sentence for the crime and the, and the gun sentencing enhancement that's typically layered on top. So, it, you know, it can be a very, very serious felony offense or, or it could be lawful self-defense. And Again, the prosecutor wasn't there when you did that. So they don't they don't know you. They don't know really in any absolute sense whether it was self-defense or whether it was uh, a serious felony. So they have to make that call. And often, um, often, sometimes 
prosecutors are making that call in a way that people think is, um, is inappropriate, too aggressively. I should not have charged that person with a 20-year felony. And if this creates enough of a hubbub, the legislature is often incentivized to pass something like this, what's called a defensive display law. But it's really mostly a feel-good statute. It, it, it's mostly just sending a, um, a message to prosecutors about how the legislature feels about these kinds of prosecutions. Uh, because if you think about it, say the prosecutor wants to charge you with aggravated assault with a firearm because you pointed a gun at someone. Well, the law already presumes you're innocent. You're presumed innocent until you're proven guilty. So you're pre it's presumed that your pointing of the gun was lawful until it's proven that it was unlawful. The difficulty there, of course, is the process of proving it unlawful is extremely expensive to you, uh, time consuming and dangerous because you could be convicted even if you're innocent, right? That's just the noise in the system. And juries are dangerous and unpredictable uh, creatures. Um, but really, this is not giving you anything that you didn't already have, because all it's really saying is, if your display was for lawful purposes, it's not a crime. Well, it's already not a crime. You, you don't need a defensive display statute for that. If it was in lawful self-defense, it's not a crime, right? Self-defense is a perfect legal defense to a use of force charge, like aggravated assault with a firearm. So it's really more of a feel-good statute, but it can give uh, prosecutors additional cover uh, to not bring charges and feel like they have a, a more robust foundation to stand on for not bringing the charges. So in that sense, I think these are good. I think you know I'm in favor of them, uh, but they're not as meaty as people often mistake because if the prosecutor doesn't believe your story about it being in self-defense, then you're not getting the benefit of this defensive display statute. You're getting charged. All right. I think that is, that is, we got through it all. Uh, so time to take a look at questions. So folks, as always, uh, if you want a comment or question addressed by me personally, I'm happy to do that. If you're on YouTube, it needs to be a $5 super chat minimum. Uh, if you're on rumble it needs to be a $5 rumble rant minimum. If uh, you're a Law Self-Defense member and you're watching this stream on the member dashboard and you're in the chat, just put your question in the chat uh, and I'll be happy to address it for free there. That's part of the benefit of being a Law Self-Defense member. Instead of paying $5 a question, you pay less than $10 for an entire month. Every month is less than $10, about 30 cents a day, and I'll answer all your questions on every show for free. Free meaning nothing beyond the 30 cents a day you're paying. Uh, you can become, any of you can become a member right now at lawofselfdefense.com slash join. Just open up another tab in your browser, lawofselfdefense.com slash join. Uh, right there. I'll put it at the bottom. And, um, and you get other benefits too. So we, like, for example, in today's show, I'm going to embed all the news articles and, and bills and stuff that I shared with you here today, I'll, I'll link them in that, in the blog post version of today's show. Uh, you also get the members only podcast uh, version of our content and lots of other stuff. 30 cents a day, folks. It's just not that much. Heck, you should do it just to show your support, right? Uh, all right. So let me take a look. First, I'll go to the member dashboard. Let's see. Ba, ba, ba. Uh, Law self-defense member Miles Dog says, explain the lower court whack-a-mole process leading towards SCOTUS. Um, I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure I understand the question. So in in a there's a variety of ways things can get uh, to SCOTUS. Um, if, if we're talking about the general appellate process in criminal courts, I mean you start with the trial court and that judge makes rulings of law. Um, and then if you get acquitted, it's all over, right? Because there's no double jeopardy. You can't be tried twice for the same crime in the same jurisdiction. Um, but if you're convicted at trial, you can appeal to the, in most states, the mid-level appellate courts. Uh, if they affirm your conviction, you can appeal up to the state Supreme Court. Actually, from the mid-level appellate courts, um, either party can appeal. Uh, so generally speaking, when you're at trial, if you're acquitted, the prosecution's done. They, they don't have a privilege to appeal your acquittal. Generally, there's rare exceptions. Um, if you're convicted, you can appeal. So for practical purposes, from the trial level to the mid-level appellate courts, only one person can make that jump. Uh, you're convicted, you file for appeal. That's the only way to get there, really, for the most part. 
Um, but from the mid-level appellate courts, now we have an appellate court making a ruling of law, and you can appeal that if it goes against you to the state Supreme Court, or the state could appeal it uh, if it goes against them to the state Supreme Court. Uh, you generally don't get into federal court unless you've gone through this criminal process you know, on a federal criminal charge, um, or if there's some kind of uh, you know, enumerated constitutional right or privilege at stake, uh, and then uh, you might work your way up through, uh, or if a statute is passed and people are arguing that it's unconstitutional, it may work as, you know, someone would, it violates the U.S. Constitution, some U.S. constitutional right you have, that could be argued in federal court. And then it would go up to the Court of Appeals, and then it would go up to the U.S. Supreme Court from there. Um, if that sounds like a horribly expensive process and, and really time-consuming, it is. It is. Uh, that's why a lot of the things that get to the Supreme Court, generally they, they're well-funded on both sides. Lots of friend-of-the-court briefs by people who are not parties to the litigation but want their opinion voiced uh, to these courts, especially to the Supreme Court. So, yeah, but by the time it, something gets to the U.S. Supreme Court, it's you know millions and millions and millions of dollars have been invested, typically on both sides, uh, in favor of their arguments. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Someone says, uh, Tax Pro Pam says, Indiana did not advance their bill modifying self-defense law. I'm, I'm not familiar with that one, Pam, sorry. Um, law self-defense member D. Garen, question. I seem to recall a state or SCOTUS decision a century or so ago on self-defense where there was no time to ponder or apprehend when faced with an upturned knife. Uh, Google search was useless, of course. Do you have a reference? Uh, I believe it's U.S. v. Brown. Um, detached reflection cannot be expected in the presence of an uplifted knife. Let's see. And the exact quote. Yeah, Brown v. U.S. is the Supreme Court decision. If a man reasonably believes he is in immediate danger of death or grievous bodily harm from his assailant, he may stand his ground. Uh, and if he kills him, he has not exceeded the bounds of lawful self-defense. Detached reflection cannot be demanded in such instances. So this whole detached reflection issue really goes to uh, the reasonableness standard. We're not required to make perfect decisions in self-defense. We're allowed to make mistakes in self-defense. We're allowed to be factually wrong in self-defense. Um, but our mistakes have to be reasonable mistakes. They can't be irrational, speculative, imaginary. Uh, so someone, um, someone's wearing a hoodie and they, they say, give me your money. And they have their hand in the pocket of the hoodie and they're pointing an apparent muzzle of a gun through the cloth of their hoodie. So you draw your own pistol, step off the X and solve that problem with defensive force, kill them. And then it turns out they didn't actually have a gun. That was just their finger. Did you make a mistake? Were you wrong? Yeah, you were wrong. You, you thought you were defending yourself against a deadly force threat, but there was no deadly force threat. Does, does that mean you lose the privilege to use deadly force in self-defense? No. Uh, what matters is not the actual circumstances, what matters is your reasonable perception of the circumstances. This also comes into play with the, the stress of a fight, right? You're in an actual fight, you've been attacked, you're defending yourself. You, you just, you don't make perfect decisions uh, and you're not required to make perfect decisions. You're required to make reasonable decisions. And that's what that's reflected in that language. Detached reflection, like a prosecutor or a judge or a jury might apply in evaluating your use of force cannot be expected in the presence of an uplifted knife. How we make decisions under life-threatening attack is, is just is, is different. And that should be taken into account in determining the reasonableness of our decision-making. Um, yeah, here's a good point. Uh, tax Pro Pam uh, writes, uh, or curtilage means something for a homestead property tax exemption, but it means something completely different for self-defense law, something else for any other law. Yeah, we always have to be careful uh, when we're using legal terms of art like curtilage, uh, it may not mean quite the same thing in different legal contexts. So if you were to do legal research on the phrase curtilage, most of the hits you would get have nothing to do with use of force law, nothing to do with self-defense. They, they would mostly have to do uh, with Fifth Amendment search and seizure law. Uh, when does the state have to get a warrant to search property? Well, in your house, obviously, but also within the curtilage of the house. But that scope of curtilage for search and seizure for warrant purposes uh, could be much broader or, or narrower than the definition of curtilage 
for the purposes of uh, were you privileged to use deadly defensive force or did you have a legal duty to retreat from where you were standing? Um, so you have to be careful. Uh, same term of art, but different meanings, effective practical meanings in different legal contexts. Let's see. Uh, Law self-defense member Miles Dogs asks, if I exit my immobile car in order to pull from appendix, so that would be an appendix carry position for a pistol, uh, against a disproportionate number of threatening contact weapons, do I lose innocence or reasonableness? Uh, so the, the, you, you lose innocence or reasonableness. You lose innocence if you're the initial aggressor in the confrontation or if you intentionally provoke the other party's aggression. Now, this can also be interpreted in terms of, did you go to the fight, right? If you go to the fight rather than the fight coming to you, it rarely looks like self-defense to anybody. Um, in this kind of riot, looting, arson situation, uh, your, your car has been immobilized, you're stuck in the car, you're surrounded by people with impact weapons, and you decide to get out of the car to draw your gun to engage those people. Uh, well, were they actually attacking you? Are they, are they just walking around with impact weapons, right? You need to be defending yourself uh, if you're going to claim self-defense. Um, my inclination would be to stay inside the vehicle and compel them to breach the vehicle um, because that, that really removes all ambiguity about who was the aggressor in the confrontation or if not breached the vehicle, you know, anything comparable. Uh, they're setting fire to the vehicle. You got to get out of the vehicle, right? Uh, they're about to breach it. They're raising a brick to smash the window to get into the car. Then they're, they're breaching the vehicle, removes all ambiguity. Um, sometimes you can't wait, right? Sometimes you're, you have to leave because you have other obligations, right? There's someone over there you have to defend outside of your vehicle. So you have to go defend them. Uh, but you'd, you'd want to be able to articulate why you got out of the car. Um, you may want to get out of the car for tactical reasons because you believe you're, you're more capable of effectively defending yourself if you have freedom of movement. Uh, to do so. And that would be reasonable. And again, that's what you'd want to articulate. So you had a lawful, reasonable reason for exiting the vehicle. Uh, but all these things are extremely fact sensitive. So small changes in facts have very big changes in legal outcome. That's why you're a member of law self-defense. So you get constant access to this exposure to this kind of uh, content. Um, Yes, James, law self-defense member James says, rather good gun law program for an avowedly non-gun lawyer, law lawyer. Yeah, I don't do gun law. I do use of force law. But all of these, you know, the, the Venn diagram between gun law and use of force law does have overlap. And of course, the most effective way of defending yourself against a deadly force attack is typically with a firearm. Uh, so I thought there was enough overlap here. It was worth, worth covering. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I carry I carry appendix, and I have no trouble drawing drawing my firearm safely while seated in the vehicle. So maybe maybe something to think about. Uh, if I couldn't, I I might not carry appendix. All right, next take. That's all the member questions and comments. Let me take a look now and see if any super chats. I know at least one came in. Super super super. Uh, just one, Mud Duck, $10 super chat, thank you very much, says, can a person visiting a state, snowbirds, carry in a constitutional carry state while visiting? I have Idaho concealed carry enhanced, but visit Arizona all winter. You know, different states do this differently. So different states uh, are constitutional carry. My understanding is, now again, I don't do gun law, right? Uh, but my understanding is that some states are constitutional carry for all lawful human beings within their borders. But other states are constitutional carry only for their residents. So you'd want to be very careful about that, obviously. Uh, let's see. And that was it for Super Chats. Let me take a look at Rumble. And uh, nothing. Nothing on Rumble. All right. Well, folks, I think that effectively wraps up the show for today. Uh, I might have some interesting news. I'm... I'm um, meeting up with a bunch of friends, uh, kind of an eclectic group, but rather high profile in the uh, the YouTube gun community. And uh, I'm not sure how much of that I'll be able to report out. I'm kind of a first-time invitee uh, to this group. 
Uh, so I don't know what the kind of the social rules and norms are, but if I can, if I can, I will be bringing a, a GoPro and a camera and uh, we'll see, uh, we'll see what use I can make of that. Hopefully I'll be able to share some of that with all of you. Uh, we'll have to see, we'll have to see, but uh, until next time, I will, of course, remind all of you that if uh, you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law. So you're hard to convict. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe. Thank you.